Hello? 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 Okay. I, I Hello? Good morning. Good morning, Francis. Hello, yes, good morning. Good morning. Yes. Uh, we are going to be starting shortly. The chair, Dr. Kalist in Muga, is, has connected. And within like the next two, three minutes, we'll be starting. We apologize for the delay. I'm really sorry, I can't uh, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, morning. good morning. Yes, uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome you. We are going to start this webinar. We are already some minutes late. Uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Water and Environment through the Water Resources Institute, let me welcome you to the seventh webinar, the series of monthly webinars. And for today, we are going to have a webinar on integrated natural resources and sustainable land management practices for climate resilience. And to be based on the response grant from implementing agro feed schools and watershed management. And this webinar is organized by the Ministry of Water and Environment through the Water Resources Institute with the International Institute for Rural Construction and Food and Agriculture Organization. I want to thank all of you for sparing time to come and attend this webinar. For those who are attending for the first time, these webinars are held on the last Friday of the month from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we encourage all of those who would want to share with other stakeholders, the work they are doing to reach out to the Water Resources Institute so that we can share and schedule you the subsequent webinars. And I want to thank FFO and IIR for coming over to share with us the work they have been doing. Uh, we have two hours of this webinar, but all will depend on what we want to discuss. So on this note, I'm going to hand over to Madam Pamela Nyamutoka and Mr. Robert Kalisa to take us through the webinar so that we can get to know what they have been doing in the, on this subject. And later on, there will be opportunities for questions and clarifications. And we shall come back later towards the end as we close the webinar and also give you other information on the next webinar. So can I hand over to you, Pamela and Robert? You handle it the way you have organized it. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chairperson, thank you also for giving us this opportunity as the uh, world Institute to be part of the knowledge management and uh, and dissemination uh, around uh, integrated water resources. Uh, thank you very much to FAO who has been a very long 
a partner of WIWR and, and uh, a lot of the experiences that Robert will be sharing actually is also drawn from partnerships with the FAO. Thank you to all the participants who have joined and uh, we are looking forward to hearing a lot from you. Uh, so for this webinar in particular, we want to focus on uh, understanding the agro uh, pastoral and farmer field school uh, watershed approaches uh, around integrated natural resources land management. We know that this has uh, climate change is real and so we want to share uh, what have been our experiences, particularly working in the rural communities. As you know, double I, double R is uh, 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 centered, is a, uh, an organization that is centered on rural transformation and particularly also amplifying and empowering if that everything that uh, we want to do can only be done if you harness the powers that rural communities have. So we also want to understand how how is it that uh, we can you know practically use the integrated water resources management approach in what we call the agro pastoral field schools, and uh, Robert will be you know will be giving you know, very detailed uh, uh, practical approaches on how these are interlinked and how they can be integrated. We'll also be able to appreciate the regional experiences, uh, particularly we'll be looking at areas that are semi-arid, uh, particularly uh, areas around in Karamoja, as well as also experiences around Northern Uganda. So we want to, again, uh, thank you, thank the Minister of Water and Environment for providing this very powerful platform for learning and, and knowledge that we believe we'll be able to, you know, support uh, uh, the growth uh, of the integrated water resource management in our country and even out of our country yeah, at a regional level, and also to see uh, all partners can take up this approach at a practical level. So without further ado, I will uh, um, Robert, thank you very much. I'm not sure if I introduced myself, actually. I think I realized I just I didn't introduce myself. My name is Pamela Nyamtoka Katoro, and I am the Africa Regional Director for WIWR, also uh, Country Director IWR. IWR is a mouthful, <laughs> International Institute of Rural Reconstruction. Uh, and you know, an international organization that's working here in, in Uganda, but as well in the Africa region, South Sudan, uh, Zimbabwe, and uh, and as well as in Asia. So we're able to bring on those regional experiences to see how we can enrich our country. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Robert. Yes, thank you very much, Pamela, and good morning to all of you. I'm hopeful you are able to hear me. Can I confirm that uh, you are hearing my voice? Yes, we yes. are. Ah, then that is good. Once again, Robert Kalisa, I also want to take this opportunity to welcome you to this webinar. We are going to present it. Uh, we are four panelists, but me, I will start by giving um, the overall experience of how we have been doing it. Then my other colleagues, that is Bernard Fungo from FAO, uh, Paul Nyeko and Pamela will be uh, putting in the discussion so um, thank you very much and you're welcome. Our main topic is integrated natural resources management and sustainable land management practices for climate resilience. And we are going to share our experience in implementing farmer field schools or agro-pastoral farmer field schools and watershed management approaches. So um, I'm just going to give a brief presentation and then after 
we will now go into the discussions. In terms of the learning objectives, at the end of the webinar, we expect that uh, at least members will understand uh, agropastoral and farmer field school and watershed approaches, uh, especially in natural resource management and sustainable land management practices. And also members will appreciate how these approaches are interlinked and also appreciate the experiences that we will share uh, from the regions, especially in Karamoja and Teso, and also part of Northern Uganda. So in terms of our experience in farmer feed schools and uh, watershed management approaches, um, it is over 20 years experience where we have worked with the, a number of partners, but specifically FAO, where we have developed a number of materials. This is just an example of the materials which we have documented. Um, one of the materials in the screen, you will see how we have partnered with FAO to introduce the farmer feed school uh, approach in, in, in institutions of higher learning. And, 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 and uh, we, we have developed this material which can be used to be integrated in institutions of higher learning at any level uh, for implementing farmer feed schools. Uh, also, we have partnered with a number of organizations, including FAO and the World Meteorological Organization, to develop another material of uh, another set of materials on how we can use the farmer field schools uh, in terms of climate change adaptation and building resilience activities. The number of materials we have over fifty, uh, over uh, ten materials, and also uh, at an opportune time we can also document the experiences in the watershed approach. So um, in terms of the introduction, um, we, we have started the webinar by uh, defining what for us we understand as integrated natural resources management. Of course, there are so many definitions, but for us, we are looking at the integrated natural resource management as a conscious and continuous process of um, incorporating and understanding the multiple aspects of natural resources in, 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 in the system. Um, and here we are looking at a number of natural resources, uh, the water resources, the forest resources, food resources, energy resources, biomass, the number of resources that are, are interconnected and integrated. But also, uh, it is a process of understanding the complex environment and, and the complex interactions between the environment uh, and people, what we call the socioeconomic environment interlinkage. So it is a process, um, it is a conscious and a continuous process of understanding uh, the management and the different interactions. But also what we strongly believe is that uh, the farmer field school as an approach is still at the center when it comes to understanding complex problems in natural resources. In terms of the approaches, specifically, there are two approaches of integrated natural resource management. The first approach, um, uh, we call it the utilitarian management approach. And this approach was specifically popular in the 1930s up to 1960s. Um, and specifically, um, governments were the ones responsible in managing natural resources. So this approach was not very popular uh, because it was characterized with bureaucracies, um, you know, kind of reactionary strategies. Government was the only entity which was uh, responsible for managing natural resources. And at the late, uh, and then it, it created some kind of uh, disjointed uh, management of natural resources. So uh, the approach was not popular. But during the 1970s and 80s, we saw the emergence of integrated approaches, especially after realizing the, the shortcomings of the utilitarian approach. And uh, of course, the integrated approaches, uh, in contrast, they emerged because the actors 
feel that uh, most of the environmental problems are complex, they are interconnected, they are multidisciplinary, they are associated with the uncertainty, and also uh, they vary across the different uh, spatial and temporal scales. So the severity and complexity of the, pro of the environmental problems uh, motivated the creation of integrated approaches uh, in natural resource management. And in this slide, we have tried to give some of the examples and the way we are using them. Of course, uh, the number of uh, you know, terminologies, some people are calling them integrated resource management, integrated land management, integrated environment management, integrated catchment management, uh, and all these are now uh, integrated approaches, especially when we look at management of natural resources. And for us specifically in this presentation, we will be presenting about the watershed approach. It is an integrated system of managing water and related resources uh, in a defined geographical area. And this is an example of the watershed where we have a number of uh, interconnected kind of interactions in the environment, in the resources, in the water, and all the others. So um, uh, in terms of now the farmer field school, which is now the gist of our presentation, it is also an integrated approach to natural resources management. And um, uh, this approach, um, briefly about it, it is a group-based approach, um, which um, teaches resource users, especially farmers or other resource users, on how they can experiment and solve uh, problems uh, independently of themselves. Uh, for us, the promoters, even we call it a school without borders. And maybe in this webinar, maybe members are expecting that ah, maybe farmer field schools, these are schools which are constructed. No, it is a school without walls. And uh, the approach um, was popular, especially in the late 90s, 1980s, and um, specifically was introduced by FAO uh, for rice farmers in Indonesia. And of course, uh, the participants were selected based on their literacy skills, where they, they would be able to analyze. And, and eventually, we saw the program uh, growing. It moved from only the rice, and it was gradually adopted in, 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 in Asian countries. And also, it took on different commodities, like vegetables, cotton. Uh, and of course, initially, it was developed for integrated pest management. But we have seen the approach adopting, being adopted and being expanded in, in a number of countries, over now almost 100 countries. So the approach has been adopted by a number of governments, uh, international organizations, international agencies um, in, in their development work. But also we have seen the farmer field school approach uh, it has been incorporated in a number of sectors and development areas. For example, FAO and other partners have integrated it in the restoration and management of forest landscapes. For example, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, uh, so many organizations have adopted the approach uh, uh, to, to address issues of pest management. Um, we are also seeing the approach very popular in terms of developing climate change adaptation and resilience programs. Uh, for us, as also IIIR, we have adopted it in uh, the agro-pastoral or in the pastoral landscapes, especially in restoration of uh, degraded rangelands and pasture management activities, and also uh, sustainable land management initiatives in different countries, uh, all the way from Asia and also here in Africa the approach is very, very popular. And also in terms of uh, developing high value crops and, and value chains, the approach has specifically been adopted. But of course, uh, there are other approaches which we also want to emphasize. Um, um, of course, all of us are using these approaches.
Hai Robert. Robert, we are not hearing you again. I think we've lost Robert. Let me try to follow up. Uh, Robert is having network challenges. He's trying to connect again. We can wait uh, briefly. We are waiting. Uh, Paul, are you able to take, uh, to continue? I'm not sure how long Robert will take to be able to join again. Okay. Doctor, your hand was up. Doctor Kali's hand was up. Doctor, were you saying something? Are we able to see it? Yes, yes, we can. I think Robert was trying to summarize on this point where I was talking about. Uh, I think Robert was on slide uh, nine. Is it correct, Pamela? Yes, yes, he was. Okay, let's continue from the next slide. Uh, the next slide is uh, we are, according to our presentation, we are looking at the different 
Excuse me, Paul. Yes. Is it okay if you could uh, uh, put in, in presentation mode? Thank you. Okay, we, the next slide is looking at the philosophy and principles of uh, the Pharma Field School, where uh, as a practitioner, we base ourselves majorly on, on the fact that uh, the best learning takes place by doing rather than telling uh, the stories or teaching. So here we are meaning always when we are in the garden with our farmers, we do more of uh, the principle of demonstrations and we allow the farmers themselves to do uh, the work physically other than doing most of the theory or uh, taking them through the, uh, 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 the illustrations. Uh, the other principles that we base ourselves always is on the facilitators does not uh, lecture uh, the resource users, but help them to learn by asking questions and build on their experiences and observations. So always uh, the facilitators guide the farmers to, 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 to use the available resources much as we bring in new uh, technology, but we also encourage them to use the available resources uh, through asking questions and building on their experiences. What we have realized from the field, farmers do have uh, different skills that need to be boosted and through uh, uh, adoption of, of farmer field schools, we were able to observe uh, different experiences and then the new uh, skills uh, employed by them. We also realized that uh, the farmers themselves are encouraged to make their own uh, discoveries and draw conclusions. Always when we are concluding uh, in the farmer field school calendar, we bring in the topics, a special topic, we bring in uh, a different session, which lead them to discuss. And then after the discussion, we draw uh, or we discover conclusion on what the farmers have been doing. And then they use the, the recommendation from the discovery, uh, especially during agroecological system analysis, where we do the study of insects interacting with the different crops, plant and environment. Then we compare notes with the experience of the farmers, and then we conclude on what works well with them. Then we also look at ecosystems integration and learning from the environment, which is key. Uh, in most cases, the farmers, they have the answer within uh, the environment. And when you, you lead them through uh, the, 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 the material, they easily learn about the key things and how they, they, they interact within the environment. That is what we have been emphasizing on the key principles. Other, other principles are there, but because of uh, time, we may not discuss all of them. Let's look at another slide, uh, which is the, the implementation. A typical farmer field school uh, consists of eight to 12 uh, weeks of hands out farmer exper experimental and non uh, formal training during a single crop growing session. That is what we always encourage them uh, to do. We have a calendar where each group, uh, they make their own timetable and then we guide them that uh, a typical farmer field school must consist of eight to 12 weeks of an hour farmer experimentation. Then during, after the experimentation, they take the lead in now doing other activities which follows. Uh, the, the three weeks, the three months activities. We also encourage farmers, uh, or we expect them to attend weekly classes over uh, one growing session. 
For example, uh, when we are dealing with the arable crops, or when we are dealing with tree crops, or when we are dealing with the fruits crops, or when we are handling meeting, uh, different, uh, different expectation, uh, we, we expect them to come weekly to attend classes on the different topic that we identify them to, to learn. Uh, it can be fourth week, I mean fortnights, or it can be uh, weekly, depends on the program with the farmers. Then the next implementation schedule is uh, for livestock. The farmer field school group meets for a full year, uh, one or four hour session per week, making implementation medium term and field uh, exper experience, exper experiments related to livestock issues, especially breeding and feeding of uh, cattle. Uh, the next slide, look at preparation steps, preparatory steps leading up to the implementation of uh, farmer field school. So during the preparatory uh, stage, we always do uh, the first thing, uh, identification of the focus uh, farmer field school groups from the community. This can be the pre uh, spontaneous group. This can be the existing group. This can be the, the group that we identify them from the church can be any simultaneous group, can be any cooperative group. We take them through the project. We lead them through the objective of the project, awareness creation, and then we identify the group uh, within the uh, location of the project. Then after that, we give our form to identify the participants from the community. Who are those who are willing to register themselves in the group, and then they form themselves for group learning. Then the next stage is identification of the learning site. This is the garden. We identify the garden with them. Alongside, they do enterprise selection. As we identify the garden, they also identify uh, the crop that they want to learn on. Then we do the training of the facilitators. After the training of the facilitators, the facilitators will now enroll the training to the different farmer field school group. The farmer field school group together with the facilitator, they develop the curriculum for implementation throughout the year. I'm back. Sorry, I had, uh, uh, I think my internet totally blacked out, uh, but now I'm back. Okay, thank you, Robert. Welcome. You can now begin from uh, 13. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, specifically here, we 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 have put up this slide, especially if you want to develop farmer feed schools and watershed approaches. What do you need to do? Well, it depends on the type of environment or ecosystem or it depends on the availability of natural resources that you have. But what is very, very important is that there are common processes which must be taken into account. So you can design farmer field schools, you can design watershed approaches, wherever you are, depending on the different natural resources that you're working on, or depending on the ecosystem, or depending on the community where you are working. So uh, next slide, we have summarized the next slide, we have summarized the processes into um, yes, Paul. Robert, I can share. I can yes, share, share my screen again. Are members able to see the presentation? Yes. 
Yes, you could put oh. it in presentation mode. I've already put it in oh, yeah. presentation yeah, yeah. mode. Oh, okay, okay. So when you are designing this approach, or when you are designing the former field and watershed okay. approach, we have given in a guiding framework that you can specifically use. The guiding framework is simple. It has around four or five steps that are very, very important. But what is very, very critical is the participation of the different stakeholders when you are designing the former field school. Uh, this is still the framework which we have used for one of the projects, which we have implemented with FAO, Ministry of Water, and, 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 and the other partners. Uh, the framework has around four or five steps, which I'm going to run you through. The first one is um, community engagement or mobilization. And then the second um, uh, is about understanding the problems in the community and the challenges. And then you come up with an action plan or a watershed plan, and then you should be able to implement and then you build the capacity of the institution. So that is uh, the overall framework. Then in terms of the core pillars, specifically when we are designing former field school approaches and watershed approaches, um, 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 these are the core pillars for our projects. And specifically, I, we can call them a three stone core pillar. On one hand, you should be able to improve the economic situation of the resource users, especially the farmers, and um, you should have activities which create opportunities for them to increase their income, their livelihoods, their food security. That is one of the core pillars when we are designing farmer field schools and watershed approaches. On one hand, or on one hand, uh, one of the building blocks is supporting them to improve their economic situations. Then on the other hand, you should be able to design now projects and programs in the in the watershed, which are geared at which are geared at restoring the ecological integrity of the watershed. And also the third pillar is you should be able to develop institutions, whether farmer institutions, whether community-based institutions, whether sub-county district and all the other institutions. But specifically what we're emphasizing, you should be able to develop the watershed and also the, um, the, 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 the farmer institutions. So we have summarized the methodology into um, uh, four steps or uh, processes, uh, the entry phase, the planning phase or preparatory planning phase, the implementation phase, and also uh, the phase out. Because uh, most of the projects which we develop in most cases, they have a timeline. So um, we will go deeper into understanding these different phases. Um, where you do pre-watershed assessment, sensitization of communities, uh, you do the planning phase, you do the disaster and risk assessment uh, and all the other processes. And then you should be able to come up with an action plan, which you should be able to implement. And then you should be able to move out. So um, in terms of the components, there are very, very many. Uh, but of course, this depends on on uh, your objectives. The components can be soil and water, they can be rural energy, pasture management, tree planting, nutrition, uh, name it. So there are a number of uh, different interventions. Uh, then in terms of coordination, it is also very, very important because um, you need to have a very good coordinating system where you are able to coordinate with the local institutions. These are the local governments, you are able to coordinate with the community institutions like the Watershed Development Association. Uh, it can be a village disaster management committee. It can be a farmer field school, you know, but what is very, very important is uh, you should be able to have uh, a very good coordination. So those are the three core, core uh, principles. Then in terms of the actions, we have summarized the actions. For example, when you are doing the entry phase in the pre-watershed assessment and awareness creation, this can take like six months where you do orientation, you work with the communities to define the boundaries of the watershed, where you are going to work, you form groups. And then after that, you can now go into the second phase or the planning phase where you 
work with the community members, with the farmer field school, with the, all the other members to assess the different problems which they have. And then you should be able to come up with a very simple uh, management plan or land use plan. And then uh, you also work on developing other uh, community institutions. Then now you can start the implementation. And of course, the implementation should follow the three core principles, improving biophysical conditions, uh, creating opportunities for incomes, and then strengthening coordination of institutions and all the other activities. Then you should be able to phase out at any time. So we are going to share some lessons on how we have implemented this approach in Karamoja, in Teso, and then in Northern Uganda. So the first step, like how I have emphasized, is community mobilization. And in terms of community mobilization, you have to invite and involve all the members to uh, participate in activities where they are able to discuss what are their pertinent issues, what are their problems, what are their uh, uh, challenges. And, and, and of course, this process of community mobilization is very, very important. This is one of the community mobilization meeting, which we, 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 we did uh, in Karamoja, inside of Kotido. Then the second uh, activity that is very, very important is you should support the community to understand their risks and challenges. And of course, we always emphasize using simple approaches like the disaster risk reduction approach. This is an approach which we have used for years to understand different uh, risks. They can be climate risks, they can be environmental risks, they can be food security risks, they can be disaster risks. Uh, and of course, um, you, you look at the capacities, you look at the vulnerabilities, and then you look at the uh, hazards, and then you come up with strategies. So we have used this. Um, we have also used the climate risk uh, methodology so that you analyze the different climate risks and hazards, and then the vulnerabilities of of people and their capacity. So these are some of the simple tools which we always use in understanding vulnerabilities. Then the third activity, which is very, very important when you are designing farmer field schools and watershed approaches, you should be able to design or you should, able, you should be able to rely on participatory approaches. Uh, and one of the approaches which we strongly emphasize is the transit works. Uh, in the transit works, you should be able to organize the community members and they should actively participate in the delineation of their watershed. They should understand their watershed. They should understand their community in terms of where is the upstream, where is the midstream, and where are the downstream communities. Which, which are the villages which are forming their watershed? Which are the villages in the upstream, midstream, and downstream? You should organize so that the members are able to participate in the activities. Then during the transit walk, it should be well planned and organized where you are able to uh, help the members understand their assets or their resources in the community, their forests and their rivers and everything. Then the members should be able to analyze their food security needs in terms of the crops, in case they have invasive weeds, where are they located? Um, where they are grazing areas. And then uh, this is one of the key, key activities which we do when we are designing watershed uh, projects so that you are able to come up with a very well good watershed plan. So we have developed a number of tools. Some of them we will share in, in, in after the discussion here on how you can organize a very good transit walk within the community. In this picture, this is one of the transit walks which we made when we were helping, when we were working with farmers in Teso. This is the uh, Apeduru Dam. It is one of the big, big dams in, in Teso, that side of Capel Biong. And in this transit, when we were doing it, uh, the community members uh, uh, realized that there was a lot of flooding in the downstream area because one of the embankments of the dam had been destroyed. And of course, through the facilitative process, we were able to come up with projects on how we are going to stabilize the, 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 the broken embankment because 
uh, there was a lot of flooding. But what is very, very, very important is projects and the people participating in defining their own watershed is very, very important. Of course, um, after the transect, then you can use other tools like the participatory disaster risk assessment tools where you are able to rank and uh, identify the different challenges. And here we encourage the participation of people using local materials. Uh, you should be able to facilitate them to understand their problems. And here we use a problem tree yeah, develop resource maps, develop a number of materials that are, are very, very important. But also what is very important, you have to complement all this information with also other sources of information. This can be geospatial information. This can be maps. This can be part of the information from the watershed and catchment plans. It is very, very important that you as the facilitator of the groups, you are able to complement the knowledge of the people with also the other knowledge which we have. And then at the end of the day, you should come up with a very simple action plan. This is an example of a very simple natural resource management action plan, which we have facilitated communities to develop. Uh, most of us as the civil society, we have we always make mistakes of developing action plans in five-star hotels and, 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 and very expensive areas. No. What we are emphasizing is that you should come up with a very, very simple watershed uh, and, and action plan, which the members are able to conceptualize. And of course, uh, you can call it an action plan, you can call it a curriculum, but for us uh, under the farmer field schools, it, it, we, we always call it a curriculum. And in the curriculum, members can be able to address either one component or integrated components that are challenging to them. The curriculum can focus on helping farmers to diversify their, their crops, maybe through breeding or what we call participatory breeding. Uh, maybe they test different um, um, efficient systems. If they, during the actual, the participatory, uh, the assessment, maybe the community had a lot of uh, drought and all the other issues, then you can help them to harvest water on their land and also through an integrated process, they can also uh, do different activities. So what is very, very important is the curriculum or what you call an action plan. And of course, um, coming up with the group laws or what we call bylaws is very important. And also at this stage, you should be able to support them to form some kind of institutions which you are going to build capacity. These can be watershed committees, very simple committees, maybe some of the committees to address issues on water, rangeland, crop production, livestock, uh, 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 livelihoods. But what is very, very important is the local participation of the institutions like the sub-counties, the parish chiefs, the extension workers, so that they are part and parcel of these bylaws or or committees. Then another critical activity is capacity training because farmers will always actively participate. And for us, we always emphasize weekly learning activities where the farmers are able to learn on different components, on good agronomic practices. And you will realize the participation of, 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 of these groups on a weekly basis. They will always come because they want to learn and experiment new knowledge. These are some of the examples of some of the experiments which we have been doing, or some of the learning activities where we have been doing integrated activities where the farmers are able to learn soil and water conservation, good farming practices. And what is very, very important, they should integrate their learning within the environment. We always call it AESA. My colleagues will discuss it. Then the other activities which are very important is exchange learning, institutional building, uh, learning from others, graduation, registration. And, and, and for us, we always emphasize that these different groups, they can form an association or an apex group at a sub-county. So what are the core learning principles 
or what have we learned from implementing this approach? You have to implement these three core pillars simultaneously. On one hand, you should be able to develop the socioeconomic activities where you are giving the farmers opportunities. They should be able to see uh, better incomes or they should actively see that they are going to benefit from these interventions. And then on the other hand, they will actively participate in the restoration of their watershed. And also what is very, very important is to build the institutions, right uh, from the sub-county, from the farmer group, uh, the watershed committees. Uh, I, this is a continuous process that you should keep on building and building and building. And then uh, you should be able to see results. So there are a number of lessons which we, we can learn. Uh, Paul Nyoko uh, is going to share with us in the next two, three minutes, the lessons learned in managing uh, in Karamoja, where Paul has managed uh, activities in, in Kakma and Sakima and Sanga in Kabong. So Paul, please, the next slides are yours. Share with us those experiences um, when you implemented the FSHUA project in Kabong, what are the lessons that you have learned in implementing this project? Of course, we started with the delineation and then participatory assessment of the watersheds. Yes, Paul. Thank you, Robert. Let me uh, begin from the very slide we are seeing here. Based on the lesson learned, when we, were, we entered uh, Kabong, we did an assessment of the bare lands, and this is what people are seeing on the pictures. So uh, after the assessment, we went on uh, mapping the hotspots, the area where we need our intervention to be done, and then the sensitization of the community members. And after sensitization, mapping of the areas, we went ahead to do the actual activities of restorations. Move to the next slide. Uh, if you look at the actual activities of the restoration, we started by measuring the acreages where we wanted our intervention to stop. So we did the mapping of hectares of all the 13 hotspots in Kabong district, including Karenga districts. So in the intervention uh, of the areas that were completely bare, we came up with a very quick plan to do uh, the following uh, restorative activities. The first one is strip planting. We had established uh, nursery beds in different parishes where we train farmers to plant uh, trees, Fidabia, Fidabia tree. Fidabia is one of the local, the local do well in any deserted area. So we made sure we collected the seeds and we trained them to do the potting, the planting, and then the nursery bed management. Uh, when the Fidabia takes uh, two months, then we encourage farmers to transplant into the bare land. But of course, we were not only doing uh, the planting of the tree, uh, Fidabia alone. Alongside a uh, Fidabia tree, we were also doing a fruits uh, tree. In the fruits tree, we targeted popo and then uh, passion fruits where farmers were also planting uh, in their gardens and then around homes. Uh, other activities included uh, uh, removing of the regenerants, some of the bird weeds that were not palatable to the animals. If eaten by animals, uh, they get sick and we involve the community to do the transect work, we map them out. Then after mapping all those bird passes, then we were able to procure 
tools and distributed to them. And we started doing the communal activity of cutting those bird weeds, uh, those bird passers, as we plan the Fidabia and other new good passers, which are plantable to animals. Other activities included a uh, direct uh, showing of the pasta seeds. Uh, we had a discussion with the livestock farmers and they advised us to do the planting of uh, different uh, grass, especially we were targeting the star grass. You can see one of the farmers is showing the, the seeds of the star grass. We were targeting the junior grass. Uh, we were targeting desmodium. Uh, we were targeting other good uh, passers that were, if farmers use them, it can bring a uh, change on the animal health and it can also give high quality milk to the livestock farmers. Alongside, uh, we did gully refilling. Uh, in Kabong, uh, some of the hot spots in Kabong were completely eroded with the action of uh, high running water that comes from up the mountain to the middle stream and downstream. So uh, we encourage farmers, though the activities was labor intensive, we we encourage farmers to carry to carry uh, some medium stones that they can afford. Uh, we knew it was not easy, but we talked to them that uh, the result of gallery filling can result into uh, getting uh, grass coverage of all this area, and you will be able to dig, you will be able to do uh, good uh, grazing, you will get a lot of pasta, and you will not move from this place to another place looking for pasta anymore. Uh, we also encourage them to do planting, line planting in some of those areas so that uh, we couldn't use only the watershed areas for only one activities. We want them also to do uh, crop planting. We also, as we encourage them to do uh, other management of the grazing land. As we were encouraging to do planting in the watershed areas. We also told them to use different practices of uh, sustainable land management measures, including uh, soil and water conservation techniques, such as the trenches. Uh, the trenches is dug around, around uh, an acre where the water collects, and then the water pit, and then other so many soil and water conservation practices, including the stone barn. The stone barn, you can see they're, they're doing the stone barn in their garden. This is to control soil erosion. They're doing refilling the uh, foreign soil or manure. It can work also well to in the facility of the land. Move to the next slide. Yeah, so these are also Move now- to the next uh, slide. I think those are the ones which we had for Karamoja. We have others. Uh, these are also other lessons which we have done in Teso, that is in Kapele Biong, now as a district. Uh, these are some of the watershed activities. Um, in, in one of the slides, we were repairing one of the embankments which uh, was broken and of course with other different watershed uh, water restoration activities and um, in the first picture which i showed you where we did the transect we were able to do tree planting activities you can see the trees this was in 2015 2016 and uh, when we went back last year this is these are now the different what the um, um, woodlots and, and and then part of the area. So these are the trees we planted, and three, four, five years down the road, the landscape has been restored. This these are also 
part of the interventions in, in TESO, and of course also livelihood activities um, on, 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 on their land where they were able to adopt new uh, farming practices. Uh, this is in Kasese, uh, one of the activities uh, which we did in, uh, in Kasese during that time. Uh, you can see in the first picture, the farmers, when they are taking their market, their produce to, to markets and, 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 and with the temporary shelters, it was very, very hard. So after organizing them in farmer field schools, in groups, then we supported them with uh, an infrastructure which can help them to market their, their crops. So what are the overall lessons which we have learned as we wrap up this discussion? Of course, we are going to open up the discussion. Um, uh, our soil and the, our sustainable land management expert, I'm sure he's on, Mr. Bernard Fungo, he's also going to share other lessons. Uh, what is very, very critical in terms of the lessons is that the farmer field schools, it follows a systematic training process, the farmer field school and watershed approach. It, it, it is a systematic uh, process where farmers are able to observe a lot of group discussion analysis, and then action planning is very, very important. So that is one of the main lessons which we have learned. Stakeholder participation is a must. That is also another lesson which we have learned. You have to engage all the stakeholders, right from the sub-county, from the watershed committees, and all the others into uh, the activities. Then institutional development is a process and a must and a continuous process. It is continuous every after month, every after period, every after quarter, you should be able to support the watershed institutions, the farmer field institutions to build their capacity in the different areas, in leadership, in monitoring and evaluation, in the, uh, documentation, yeah, sharing experiences, you know, uh, and all that. So institutional development is a must. Then uh, farmers, if they, you want them to participate in the watershed activities, they should be able to also, you should have incentives that are addressing their, uh, their problems, immediate problems. And one of the immediate problems is food insecurity. So you should have those interventions where the resource users, the farmers are able to uh, participate in the activities. And then uh, uh, participation, group learning fosters participation and especially of women. And also over the years, we realized that farmer field schools, they are very strong tools in fostering gender equity. That can be an area for discussion, but where we have implemented and also where different actors have implemented, the issues of gender equity have been achieved because of the farmer field schools. So um, that was a short presentation, which um, is, is helping us to maybe ignite discussions. So uh, right now, uh, we, we will be going into the second part of the presentation. And this is questions and sharing of lessons learned from uh, the other activities. But before we open up the discussion, uh, we wanted to invite uh, our sustainable land management expert from FAO, Mr. Bernard Fungo, so that you can maybe also share the experiences of working with the, the different regions, or it, that can come later. So um, that is the first part of the discussion, and we, we can now open up for the discussions. Back to you, Francis. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Robert and the team, for the presentation. Uh, we now want to probably request Pamela to lead into the discussions. Uh, we shall be coming back to you to the end. So probably, Pamela, you can lead in whoever you decide to lead. Pamela still there? Robert? Yes, doctor. We are, um, yes, um, 
um, some questions have come in. Maybe um, I can take the, the the discussion so that maybe we can we 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 we, we can now uh, me and Pamela and my other colleagues we can start to 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 answer some of the questions. So I, I'm calling upon the discussants. Please pick some of the questions in the chat. They have already come. They are already coming in. Uh, uh, one of the questions, how has Maybe, been... uh, Robert, sorry, uh, before we start taking the question, can we give an opportunity to, F to say something? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to be part of this meeting. Uh, my name is Bernard Fongo, and I'm uh, a consultant with FAO on sustainable land management. Um, I, I am glad that uh, uh, Robert has highlighted most of the issues that uh, we, we are doing with them, uh, with the other partners on the sustainable land management and the more specifically on the watershed approach. And uh, I actually think that uh, the questions that are coming, if we go to answer them, we shall be uh, discussing most of the things that I have um, here said and that I am going to, to say. So I actually think we can start by answering these questions as, as they come in and most of the issues will be addressed uh, uh, in respect to what uh, Robert has just presented, if that is agreeable. Okay. Uh, for example, yeah, that's very okay, Bernard. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. All right, Robert, please uh, proceed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Of course, uh, I'm seeing here the question: uh, How has been the adoption of these practices? Uh, in terms of adoption, what I want to emphasize and my colleagues will add on is that um, um, adoption is a process and there are a number of factors which influence adoption. Some of these practices, they are labor intensive. And in most cases, most of the farmers have been neglecting the adoption of the labor intensive practices on sustainable land management, like the retention ditches, because they require a lot of labor. But uh, there are other options. Even if they don't go into direct adoption, we have other measures. We have the biological measures, and these are, uh, uh, farmers have adopted them very quickly, like the grass bands, uh, the caliandra, and all the other biological soil and water conservation measures. Those are very easy for adoption. But of course, there are also other factors like labor, attitude, knowledge, and all those others. So there are a number of factors um, that influence uh, adoption. But Bernard, as the expert, you can also add on. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, 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 there have been, the, in my experience with the uh, water food approaches, especially, uh, has been that the, um, uh, the first thing is that for people to appreciate that what they are doing is beneficial, there has to be a way of demonstrating that uh, demonstrating impact, and in some of the uh, some of the, the the areas where I have been, we have tried to integrate what we call community-based indicators for monitoring systems change. If you will allow me, I will show you as uh, 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 I will share. Um, okay, maybe the the. the if you allow you can me, share. Just one page. Yeah, you can, can share. share. Yes, I can share just one page on how uh, on some of the indicators that were we, we are using to monitor systems change. I can't see the. Is it possible to share now? Okay. Yeah, you can share. Okay, some of the indicators that we are using to monitor systems change. Are you able to see now? No, not yet. Just click the screen, share button. So do you see now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So one of the ways to ensure that people appreciate 
uh, the, 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 what the input they are putting in is to help them to monitor system change, how the, the activities they are doing are contributing to changes in the system. During the transact works that Robert mentioned, you we need to show them the problems that they see in the land. For example, in the past case, the evidence of soil erosion can be clear to everybody, whether you are highly educated or you have never seen the chalk, you are able to see that this is soil erosion and it is a problem that we need to address. From there, you go to the interventions. Then we, in the, we together with the community, you agree that in order to stop this, there has to be something done. Okay, so once you agree on something done, you go back and agree that every six months, we shall be coming back to see whether these things that we don't want to see are actually disappearing by measuring their sizes, their numbers. So this is one way to ensure that farmers actually appreciate that indeed what we are doing is, and uh, like Robert has said, adoption is a long process. So this can happen over a, a number of years, but it has to be consistent working with the community so that, so the other indicators can include uh, local indicators of soil quality. How is the soil quality changing in terms of the color, the, 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 the color of the crops? If they are pale, then the quality of soil is poor. If they are green, then the quality of soil is, is good. So the management of soil to change these indicators is what you, you demonstrate with. And then, of course, there are other practical ways of demonstrating to farmers, like using the soil test kit, which is the widely available and can be purchased locally. And then the other things like the quality of water, turbidity can also be uh, seen by simply uh, looking at the clarity of water in a glass and also looking, observing vegetation in the landscape uh, during particular parts of the season. And then also counting how many livestock, how many types of crops that individual households have. So these are quite small indicators that communities can be used to, you know, to, 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 to appreciate why, and this can in future improve the levels of adoption. And so, uh, 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 of course, like Robert says, it is expensive to dig some of these uh, trenches and then. Uh, but once the farmers agree that this is indeed important and they are working together to achieve ABC, then more likely we believe adoption rates will be more than, uh, than. So that is one challenge that has been a major, major limitation to adoption of this uh, water trade uh, conservation practices. Yeah. Robert? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Bernard. There is uh, another question in the chat. How is IRR and partners promoting sustainability, especially when your project is completed? Sustainability after the project. Uh, Bernard, you can also answer that on issues of sustainability. Uh, livestock mobility has been traditionally used in Karamoja to access ecosystem services. On other hand, it predisposes soil to degradation. How is this practice being handled? Uh, livestock mobility. <laughs> uh, it's okay, it's okay. So you start with the first one on sustainability, and then uh, we will address, uh, Paul, you'll address the issue of livestock mobility and degradation. Then yes, so development of natural resource, and disaster uh, departments. Thank you. Okay, on the issue of sustainability, there are two, two ways of doing it. The first one is uh, when we are intervening, there is always an entry point. And this entry point, especially, in, for example, in the Kata Corridor, the watering point has been the entry point to uh, watershed management. Because that is the point where everybody brings their livestock, that's where everybody collects water for, for domestic use. So we begin by uh, explaining, or at least uh, showing the challenges associated with the mismanagement of this uh, water, res water resource, and therefore what should be done to sustain it. And after that, we are doing what can be done. 
The other thing that happens next is we form that association which is in charge of managing the resource. And then we draw a plan of how this should be managed and the costs that go in there. And one of the things that ensures that this is continued is that sometimes there have been situations where you levy, you ask them to levy a user fee. Uh, I, I, we have had many cases in the cattle court in the where each farmer gives a certain amount depending on how many livestock they have that they bring to a drinking point. So one of them is to ensure that somebody cleans around. In some places where they have solar pumps, there is a guard. That guard has to be paid, and the money that pays that guard comes from the contribution that communities have and have, have made. Or sometimes it is, a, of course, there is always conflict of how much, how how should we, how much should we contribute? How about those who don't have livestock? And how much is a jerry can if I, you know, if I don't collect what happened? So there are all those issues, are, but they'll always be there. But what is, what is important is that broadly they agree that for them to sustain uh, management of this water resource, they have to make some contribution. And this is one way to ensure that it is sustainable. The other way is that we have hoped them to develop what we are calling catchment management plans. And some of these plans can be used to, 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 to lobby for funds from institutions, including the local government. And some of these are incorporated into the local government development plans. And in, in some places, we have had cases where the plans have been picked up by the local government and they have constructed wells, for example, after the community has proposed that there be a well here, the local government picks it up and actually implements uh, and develops a well or, or, or protects a well for the community. So these are the two major approaches that we have been uh, taking to ensure that uh, uh, these watershed plans are actually implemented sustainably. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Bernard. For me, what I just want to add there is that the farmer field schools that we established in 2007, that was in Northern Uganda. When you go back, they are still existing because the groups have learned to work together. They have learned to meet every week. They are doing saving. These are part of the principles which you, 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 you do. Once you do very good institutional development, these are groups which will never die. So for us, we are very, very impressed that um, the farmer field schools are part of the groups that can live for long. Despite other groups which are being formed because people want inputs and those things, there are some of those groups, the politicians come, they tell people to form groups in the night, uh, they write somewhere on a paper, then the next time they bring some small thing and then the group disintegrates. And those are the kind of conflicts you are always seeing in the communities. But the groups which you have facilitated using the farmer field uh, uh, principles and practices, those groups don't die. They remain sustainably there. Uh, that is for me what I can add on. Um, uh, there is a question on livestock mobility and uh, that traditionally uh, livestock mobility um, and this predisposes erosion issues. What we want to emphasize in, uh, in terms of livestock mobility, uh, uh, the, the farmer field school is one of the avenues and tools which we can use to improve the quality of the rangeland because most of these movements, of course, they even exacerbate theft because the farmers are looking for water and pasture. And in most cases, when they are scarce, they create conflicts. So for us, what is very, very critical is the restoration of the degraded areas. Once you restore the degraded area, you increase the biomass, you increase the pasture, you increase the fodder, you increase the water, then people will not move all those long distances because you are working with them to improve their landscape. And of course, the way we are doing it, we identify some of the areas which are degraded um, we, 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 with the farmer field school members, and then we treat other areas with pastures like how Paul said and all the others, then the farmers are able to compare in terms of the rangeland health, um, what are the changes they are seeing. Then 
they should be able really to, 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 to. But of course, also mobility has a number of issues. It has the army, it has all the other people. So they should actively participate in the design of the watershed activities. And we encourage members working in Karamoja, please involve the army, involve those leaders so that they actively participate. You define the, 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 the routes with, with the members or the, 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 the migration corridors. That is very, very important. Like how I have emphasized the other question which came from Kenneth um, on the involvement of district local governments and natural resource departments. These are all stakeholders and their participation is a must. You cannot compromise that one. So at all these different levels, whether district, whether sub-county, whether parish, whether a very small community group, participation is a must. And it is something that for us, we continue to build. You have to update the members almost on a weekly basis or on after two weeks. But in most cases, most of us are civil society, you take ages to update stakeholders, you are waiting for money. No, you have to update them as the process continues. Um, I think these are some of the questions. My other colleagues, uh, Pamela and the Paul, please address some of the questions in the chat. Then uh, there was also a hand from, uh, um, maybe, maybe Robert, from Gabriel. Before, yes, maybe yes. before you you move to the next question. Mm. Uh, I would like also to add my input on the second question about the factors that are affecting the adaptation, adoption of, of the practices. Uh, on the ground here in Karamoja, uh, one of the factors that affect the adoption is the insecurity of the area. Uh, always, when you move further from home, deep inside the rangeland, where armies, where uh, soldiers are not there, uh, it is not very uh, good for this uh, for the community to stay there for long or do the work there, minus uh, protection of the army. So that is one insecurity. Two, uh, it. Just to observe that uh, based on the nature of Karamoja, uh, the weather pattern, the drought, uh, and reliable rainfall always affects the activity. Because sometimes we may do our, our uh, pasta planting, but the, 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 the pasta, after germinating, the seeds will take long to, to grow, what I can add. Then there was another question on resources for restoration. Who, who provide resources for the restoration? Uh, as IIRR, we were uh, helping the, the community to provide the tools, uh, the tools which are expensive, for example, the pickaxe, uh, the pangas, and other tools that uh, can be used in the rangeland. But, uh, Aware that the tools that we are giving out, uh, we we should not be used for 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 fighting in the community. So we were uh, uh, informing the community to only use the tool during the activities. Then after using the tools, we would collect all of them and put at the sub county store, where uh, the watershed management committee were given. Uh, the storage facility to store the tools for the restoration activities. And we also provided the seeds, uh, pasta seeds, and other inputs to help them. And there was a question on curriculum that you uh, the, someone needed to understand more about the farmer field school curriculum. The farmer field school curriculum is just defined as the, the farmer's work plan the annual work plan of the farmer, the, the well-designed activities that they follow from January to, to December. What are those different activities that the farmer field school always follow? That is what we term them as our farmer field school curriculum. Then now based on 
then the, the other next question, which is on mobility, the livestock mobility. Thank you so much, Robert. You answered it well. But I would add one area of policy. Uh, working with the livestock farmers and the watershed management, including the production department, we came out with the bylaws that we we send it to the local councillors at the sub county to review it. Then after the revision, they were supposed to move and then now sensitize the community on the functionality of the bylaws of the watershed so that uh, the, 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 any activities which, which may end up into animal uh, mobility should be regulated by the bylaw. But that was not uh, completely effective because we had also challenges with uh, with the leaders and then challenges with the with the perception of the community on the bylaw because we had put some we had put some penalties that in case uh, anyone who comes from across the district with their animals to graze in Kabon, for example, there are other cross border grazing which is coming from Kenya. There are other livestock farmers who are coming from Kenya in charge of water and passes into Karamoja. And they are not aware of the bylaw that that area is protected by the Watershed Management Committee. Such people must be penalized. But it was not so easy because of the insecurity and other things. Um, yeah, thanks very uh, much, Paul. I think the issue of insecurity is coming up. Uh, there is a hand from Gabriel. Gabriel, you can you can unmute and then you ask your question as we also get other questions. Hello, members. Yes, Gabriel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, I'm uh, bringing my suggestion and questions from uh, Kabo. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation, Robert and Paul. I just wanted to ask some few questions. I'm Gabriel Okaye. Uh, my first question is, uh, I have seen the, the pictures of your implementations, uh, but the only pictures that I've, that I've seen is uh, the pictures of during and uh, before the implementations, but I've not seen the pictures after the implementation. Uh, like uh, I, want to, I wanted to see the, the, the pictures of the successful stories that you have achieved, mostly, especially in Karamoja. Uh, the second question is uh, about uh, the project you did. What were the outcome of your, your projects? And if there were some outcomes, are they the longer terms, I mean, outcomes or the short terms? The impacts of your project, is it to create a long term impact or short term impact in the, in the community? Uh, the other one, the other question, the third question is about uh, the challenges you faced when you were implementing uh, the, the, I mean, agrofield schools. What were the challenges you faced? And the first question is, uh, the audience that you're presenting, these are the people who are supposed to, at the end, implement a more successful project than a, they are predecessors. Uh, when I'm asking about uh, this, uh, my question now is: When you are doing about when you are doing the, the farmer field schools, you gave a question to Paul about the lesser land, but Paul again was giving the processes how the farmer field school was implemented. I'm asking myself: What were the lesson land when you were implementing the project in Karamoja? I want you to answer in, in that question. What were the lessons learned during implementation? Not the process, not how we were implementing. What were the lessons learned? What were the, the lessons actually gives a, a bit about the challenges also. What did you learn when we were implementing the project? Okay, thank so you. That, thank you very much. So that, the, yeah. so that the audience can learn from it and then change it at a later stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, Gabriel, uh, is there any other hand? I'm checking, is there any other hand?
So in terms of the direct questions from the participants, can I assume that that is the direct question we can pick? Yes, um, Paul, you can answer the questions from Gabriel um, on pictures before the implementation, what were the pictures after, uh, then project outcomes, challenges, audiences. Of course, um, one of the challenges which we, 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 we experienced, especially in Kabong and Karenga, is on insecurity because uh, some of these interventions, uh, uh, you know, are implemented in some of the areas where we have been having insecurity issues. So um, some of even our facilitators had to move. But what is very, very important, we kept in touch with the security institutions and the district so that we, we, we keep the staff informed. But in other areas where we were not able to reach, we empowered more the watershed committees, uh, especially I can give an example of Kakma. Eh? You know, on a fateful day, you could go and the bullets are just the, the warriors and the army, they are fighting. And of course, those are security issues that are being handled. So in some of those issues, we, we, we tried to avoid uh, the, 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 uh, the hotspots. But what is very, very critical is you empower the local institutions, the watershed committees, the farmer groups. They should do that work even if you are not there. And for us, that is one of the key issues, not looking at the organization as... as, as. Uh, then in terms of the outcomes, of course, we have the short term and then the long term. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, most of the outcomes in watershed management are process outcomes which you may not see in one or six months, but it takes time for you to see. But the short ones, for example, Paul talked of uh, integrating trees like Thidabia. These are trees which take years to establish, but as the farmers, as they are putting them in the soil, as they are growing them, you should give them the quick maturing trees. That's why Paul was able to indicate that we complemented the trees with fruit trees, the purpose, the, 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 the passion fruits, these establish very fast and they give uh, very quick benefits in, in, in the short term. Then other benefits, you may not see them physically. For example, uh, Bernard showed you the soil and water conservation structures, the, 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 the water harvesting structures. These translate into improved yield and improved you know, uh, growth of crops. The farmers are able to see that, okay, if we dig the retention ditch, if we dig the zy pit or the permanent planting basin, it will help us to hold water even in the dry season. Then they should be able, they, they, they have already seen the quick outcomes, the, 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 the harvesting of the quick maturing crops, the green grounds and all that. So um, we can share with you all these pictures. We have a lot of them. We have also pictures of the hotspots. They have transformed. Uh, in case you have not seen in the presentation, we can share them in the, in the plenary. But uh, what is very, very important is we have the short, quick outcomes, and also we have the long term. Yes, Paul, address the issue of challenges. What were the challenges? Paul, and also Bernard, you can add on the challenges, not only in Karamoja, but also in other areas uh, when we are implementing farmer field schools and watershed approaches. What are those challenges? Paul. Uh, the most common challenges, uh, I already even made mention it earlier. Uh, one of them is insecurity. Then another one is uh, unreliable rainfall, which still affects uh, the intervention. Then another one is uh, the expectation of the participants. Uh, always we try to level the expectation when we are doing the activities. But uh, uh, because of so many NGOs operating in Karamoja, there are others uh, that uh, support the community with uh, cash for work intervention after working in the field or in the garden or in the activity. They are given something uh, like incentives. And in most uh, 
uh, watershed areas you may find farmers uh, comparing uh, the activities of uh, one NGO to the other one. So meaning if you are not uh, motivating them by what they can eat or what they can get after the work, they can expect uh, from the community, uh, from the organization. That is another challenge that we have been uh, facing. And challenges could be, can be added by my colleagues who were, who were also here on the ground. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I may also just add a few uh, lessons learned from the experience in sustainable management, especially the watershed approach. One of them that I have observed is one of scale. You know, when you begin to work in a watershed, it has to have some defined boundaries and it defines the system within which you are operating. And one of the challenges, of course, is that uh, especially our facilitators are always used to the, the administrative boundaries of the village, the Sambo County, and all of this. So it gets hard for them to be able to adjust to all of the uh, the, the, the watershed up, uh, boundaries as they are defined by the drainage patterns. And so you eventually you find that uh, oh, uh, people uh, take on areas that are just too difficult to manage using the watershed approach. And therefore, they scatter activities here and there. And the effect on water movement is not seen even when a lot of effort has been put in there. So in the future, those who are intending to implement such projects, it is better to focus on a small area, concentrate efforts, and see results. Instead of scattering many, many things all over a wide area, it is not easy to see results if we take that approach. The second thing that I observed during this time is that uh, it is important to have very good facilitators, those who understand the subject matter, but also understand the social aspect of the community they are dealing with. This is where it is important to train people, at least a critical mass of uh, facilitators, they could be diploma holders or degree holders, but who understand how communities work and are able to translate the knowledge uh, well into uh, practice. For example, a transact walk. How do you facilitate a transact walk so that people are able to see the challenges in the landscape and identify appropriate solutions to address them? This is one of the things that I thought is still not uh, available uh, widely. The other thing that uh, I noticed also is that there is the policy environment in which we operate can influence how effective these things happen. I'll give an example in the Eastern region where we're working. Uh, we did this very well, and uh, people planted trees in their landscape, and uh, we left. That was about 2007. When we came back three, four years later, there was no single tree. Perhaps there were just one or two trees. Then we asked them, what happened? Where are the trees? They said, ah, ah. you see, they told us that when we plant trees on this land, half of the land is a reserve and then half of land is private. So, but the watershed covered both the private and the, and, and the public land. So they removed all the trees they respected. So we asked them what happened. They told us, you know what? Somebody told us that that part of land which belongs to government, if you plant trees, government will come and claim them. And therefore they uprooted all the trees. And you see, this is what they did not tell us when we are asking what to do and how to do it. But when we go back later, that's when we understand that it was actually something that they did not tell us from the beginning. So that means therefore that it takes a bit of time, but also it requires working more frequently and more closely with the community to understand some of the limitations that may arise uh, during. And sometimes also they are in respect to the policy environment, there are also people who have different objectives. They come and tell you in, the, in this particular community, there were two people who were both part of the administration of this, uh, this uh, watershed uh, association. But one of them, they were on opposite sides of the political divide. So one of them was telling people to plant the trees. Another one was telling them the opposite. And for whatever reason, uh, 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 
the people did not believe any of the two. And instead of doing something, they did nothing. So when we went back after another three years, that's when we began to say, okay, it seems like each of these people is influential in their own way. And so we began to engage them again. We did not throw away any of them. We brought them both on board and began to understand the positives and the negatives of each of them. And what we have learned now is that there are people who are good because they create fear. When it comes to work, the guy says, this weekend, all of us as a community, we are going to do cleaning. Now that person will enable people to fear. But the other second person was the kind that was a sort of introvert, but his opinions were highly respected. When he told us that this tree will not be planted here because of it, many people believed him. And so whatever information that required us to communicate to the people in terms of trust, we gave it to that person. But whenever there was a need for a person who can compel people to do something, we gave it to the other second party. So you see, this is the, these are all elements of community dynamics. The other, perhaps the last one I should mention is the inter integration between the watershed approach and the farmer field schools approach. They are still even among the professionals, there is a limitation in understanding of how these two are actually integrated. And what I want to point out is that the starting point is the concept of the watershed management. And then the farmer field school comes in to address specific aspects of watershed management. I'll give an example. Let us assume, like I told you about the water point in the cattle corridor. You know, there is a farmer upstream who is going to mottles and spraying them. And then the agrochemicals go into the water, which the animals and the people drink. So this is a challenge. Now, the issue is that we need to see how, as a community, we need to manage this water resource, which is all of us all. Now, we help this farmer and other farmers of this kind to manage agrochemicals better. And we can do this using a farmer field school. But managing agrochemicals better is not the only thing that we need to do to manage the water points. There could be erosion control, there could be seeding off, uh, and then there could be um, a planting the trees. So all these are things that we need to do to protect the water source. But the farmer field school can be used to manage just one of them. And it can also be used to manage not only agrochemicals, but other things because the learning thing is the process. So this is how these two are able to fit together. And I think this is the message we need to communicate to all our colleagues to understand. For now, uh, I stop there. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, Bernard. Uh, capacity building, like how we have said, is a process. And in case uh, members are interested in uh, understanding more about the watershed approach and the farmer field school approach, the good thing is that we have the platform, we have the Water Resources Institute, and um, we can easily organize the training with the ministry at the Water Resources Institute because all the materials we have, we have the experts, we have the materials, we can also share most of these lessons. Um, I will also share some videos on some of these so that members can um, continue to learn about. Uh, some of these we have prepared videos. Um, you know, in this short presentation, you can't load it with so many pictures of the change and all that, but we have the short videos which we can post, and I'm going to post uh, some of them. Um, one of the members has requested that we share the sample of the community-based indicators. Uh, Bernard is going to share that. It is a public material. He's going to share it so that the members can learn. We can also train you on how to use it. Then someone asked a question about the plants, <laughs> the, the materials which we have used. And what I can say about the plants, we, we, we have used a number of materials. We have used a number of materials, especially for rangeland restoration and also other materials for soil water conservation. For example, um, for the rangelands, mostly we have been uh, working, uh, we have used uh, materials like green leaf desmodium, and uh, silver leaf desmodium, which is uh, readily available. 
then for the stabilization of the of the of the of the soil and then retention ditches we have used the number of local materials like um, uh, sugar napia and also uh, the other materials is the residia sepium uh, which we have given out to do some of them farmers and also um, vertiva grass in some of those degraded hotspots some of the materials are vertiva grass then for the seedlings, someone has asked about the nursery beds and seedlings. Uh, specifically in Kabong, we, we, we used uh, Taidabi albida. In the local language, they call it Egerigiroi. This is one of the restoration trees that are highly recommended for rangeland and dryland areas. In fact, some countries like Zambia, like Zimbabwe, like Tanzania, they have adopted uh, the massive planting of Taidabi albida into the landscapes. So for us, when we went to Kabong, this is one of the key, key areas which we have achieved a lot in terms of multiplying the Taidabi albida seedlings, or what we call a grid roy. Very, very easy to multiply. Uh, what we did was only to encourage members to pick seeds from the trees. And those trees are there in, 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 in Kabong. Uh, in the river, in the river lines, they are there free of charge, and we were buying each cup of the seeds three thousand, in some cases five thousand, and it was an incentive. So we didn't bring seeds from Kampala or from where no. What we only brought were just the potting bags, a few little kind of you know some some uh, some small cash cash for pay, and then. Within two months, within six uh, six we are uh, with within two months. Those are eight weeks. Already the seedlings are ready for planting. That is a grigroy taidabi albida. Very easy to manage, and we have proved that it can improve the landscapes. In fact, even in some districts like Kotido, they have adopted it as a bylaw that uh, most of the members should plant taidabi albida because of the benefits which the members have seen. So in terms of managing the nursery, there is no rocket science. It is the basic management practices. Get the seeds for the, the seeds from the community, work with the community to multiply them. Then the community will provide the basic labor. And within eight weeks, you're already planting the materials. So in terms of the nursery beds, uh, it is very, very easy. Then someone asked about uh, mindset change, that uh, people think that everything should be provided by NGOs and government. Yeah, of course, we have that uh, dependence kind of syndrome, but this is uh, a process. For us, what is very, very important, like how I emphasized, you have to implement the incentives which will help the farmers to improve their livelihoods alongside the watershed activities for restoring the, 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 the watershed or the landscape. So they have to be implemented simultaneously. Once the farmers are able to see the benefits in their land, then they should be able to, to participate in the activities. Of course, there are some organizations which have been giving food. You know, you, you, you train the farmers and then they tell you, but the other organization gives us meat and chicken and, and, and all that. So those are now uh, things which we need to check. Those are some now of the issues. You do the action plan in a five star, you give farmers per diem and transport refund and all that. And then at the end of the day, it affects motivation. In fact, some of the projects which we are working, I can even share some of the experience with the one of the projects we are working with the Ministry of Water, that is the restoration of Kochi. Based uh, community development experts at the ministry have already advised that it is not always good to pay people in the community physically cash, but it is a good practice to, to give a, a small maybe uh, drink or a small refreshment uh, 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 especially if you have engaged the community for like six hours and all that, but we strongly discourage the issue of paying people cash and money wherever they come, unless when be when it is a small cash cash for work or labor intensive. But in most cases, most of the people have been paying people cash, and trust me, those are the organizations which closed and left because they realized that 
uh, what they are working on is not sustainable. So what is critically very sustainable when we talk of watershed approach, when we talk of uh, farmer field schools is to work hard so that we restore the natural resources. We increase the natural resource base. That is the biggest problem we have. Even if you come with your health and all the other programs, if you don't have enough natural resources, if you don't have enough water resources, if you don't have enough pasture and grazing resources, then in most cases, most of the other projects are affected. That's why we're emphasizing that restoration of the landscapes is priority and it is key. We need a lot of resources to improve the natural resource base because most of the farmers, they depend on these natural resources. They cut down the trees, they cut down the grass, they cut down, they burn, they do all the others. The other issue which we are still grappling with is bush burning, especially in Karamoja. That is another area that is now another topic because when we do bush burning, when people do bush burning, there are a number of factors. Other people do bush burning because of pride and maybe passion. Others, it is self-motivation. The more you burn a big area, then the more you feel that you are a man or you are a, a livestock man. Then others burn for, you know, um, uh, preparing for pastures, but we have a lot of food which we haven't documented, which is being lost when we do bush burning. So those are some of the key, key issues. Uh, my other colleagues can come in, Pamela, Bernard, Paul, um, in case of other questions which have come in the chat. Can I request that we wind up in maybe yeah. two minutes? We already yeah, passed the hour. Minutes. So if mm -hmm. we could wind up in the next two minutes so that we can release people to cash up with other activities. Just in two minutes, let's wind up any responses, then we we'll cross. Thank you. Right. right. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, it's really, really very you know, insightful. Uh, uh, Bernard, Paul, Robert, I don't have much to add because it's, it's uh, very rich. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kallis, or if anyone else has any uh, last thoughts on Bunny. Any yeah, questions? I think um, in terms of what we can do as a wrap up is that um, closely working with the Ministry and the Water Resources Institute, uh, there is a need to train more of the civil society and other actors on how the watershed approach and the farmer field school approach are integrated. So this is maybe an area which we can uh, push further and maybe we can have a training maybe even before the end of the year or early next year where we train uh, the members. Of course, let's discuss and see. We, we, we have all our partners, we have FAO, we have the ministry. This is an area which we can push with the Water Resources Institute. Otherwise, thank you very much. The number of lessons to share and we look forward. Thank you very much. Paul and Bernard. Yes, uh, thank you, Robert. Mine is just about request to the ministry. Uh, the project that uh, we supported uh, through the watershed management activities only covered uh, an handful of, of, of two sub-counties, O3, which was heavily degraded. But if you go to Karamoja, Kabong, Karenga, Kotido, we have so many sub-counties which suffer from the same problem of watershed uh, adjusts or problems. And in case uh, uh, we have some resources at the ministry that can still be used to scale up the activities, uh, learning from this brave project, it can still help because based on the lesson learned that uh, was asked uh, during the discussion, we realized that uh, only a few sub-counties were, were covered during the imp implementation of this project. And if you, you see well, the project is good at increasing or supplementing knowledge to the local farmers, uh, food su supplement, and then household income, which is uh, good. And the project can also work well through integration of 
uh, integrated uh, resource management stroke sustainable land management through massive implementation of soil and water conservation practices that farmers individually uh, should go on with the replication. Otherwise, no. I appreciate the platform and we look forward to participate in the next coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Bernard, one uh, 30 seconds, then back. Yes, in, in okay. 30 seconds, I want to thank everybody for joining this meeting. And uh, I just want to encourage, especially the high level partners, uh, as FAO, we are committed to one thing that I think we should do is to document experiences of watershed approach in Uganda. And they apparently there haven't been many examples, but I think for the next two, three years, we shall be having enough examples to document some case studies which can help us better understand how this works and then in the future scale it out to other places. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best. Yeah, thanks very much, Bernard. Back to you, Dr. And Francis. Thank you very much for the platform. Okay, thank you very much again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for attending this webinar. On behalf of the Ministry of Water and Environment through the Water Resources Institute, let me once again thank our partners, IIRR and FAO, and of course the team behind this presentation for the good sharing, a lot of knowledge, a lot of experiences, and all of us certainly have learned a lot from the work you have been doing on the ground, the farmer feed schools, the watershed approach, very, very much interesting. And I think as has been mentioned, we need to document these practices so that we can learn from them. And also based on the work that has been done also to conduct some training so that we can have a critical mass of people that can move this uh, agenda forward. We want to thank you once again. As has been mentioned, we need to mobilize additional resources to extend the work, the good work to other areas, not only Karamoja, but many parts of the country. I think these approaches are being implemented and also to see how we can create partnerships with like-minded organizations that are doing similar work so that we can create more impact. Just to mention to you that the next webinar will be held on the 28th July from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Again, you will be informed of the topic. We always want to have topics covering different areas so that we can reach out to many stakeholders. So again, look out for the invitation and hope that we'll be able to attend. I thank Pamela, I thank Robert, I thank Francis and Gwendolyn and the rest of the team at the Water Resources Institute for organizing and coordinating this webinar. And on behalf of the Ministry of Water and Environment, and on my own behalf, again, I would like to thank you and encourage you to continue the sharing and also reach out to those that have shared so that you can engage them and learn from them as you create more partnerships. Thank you very much, and I wish you a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.